It was one of those days when the hair literally stood up on the back of my neck. Do you know experiences like that? I was 18 years old. It was 1977. I had been living in Israel for about three or four weeks, and I was taken down to Jerusalem. And my friends took me through the back alleys up onto a little, just a little mound of earth where you had the most phenomenal view of the temple walls of Jerusalem. Not the view from the Mount of Olives, but to view the other side. And as I saw this phenomenal temple wall, I tingled all over. My hair just stood on end. And that was looking at this temple in ruins. The temple was one of the most magnificent buildings in the whole world. It is interesting, if you went to Rome, there were temples on almost every street corner. If you went to Israel, there was only one temple in the whole country. There was only one temple, the temple in Jerusalem. And here in Mark chapters 11, 12, and 13, the teaching here is about the temple, as there's these brackets, chapter 11 and chapter 13, bracket it, telling us the theme of everything in between. I'm just going to overview these chapters this morning. In chapter 1, uh, chapter 11, verses 1 to 21, we see that the temple is judged. The temple is cleared out. Jesus Christ, the King, rides on a colt of a donkey, humble. The king comes to the temple and inspects it, we read in verse 11. And then the next section is a prophetic action with the cursing of the fig tree which represented Israel. And here we move from the king who inspects the temple to the prophet who pronounces a coming judgment upon the temple. And then in the middle, we have the priest who cleanses the temple, who clears it all out. Here is Jesus Christ, our king, our prophet, and our priest, who comes to the temple and judges the temple. And these stories are teeming with Old Testament imagery. The Old Testament begin, uh, ends in Malachi chapter Four, verses 5 and 6, saying that I will send the prophet Elijah before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He, Elijah, will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, or else I will come and strike the land with a curse. And then Luke's gospel opens, telling us that this Elijah has come John the Baptist, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and of the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. But the people rejected their king. And so he fulfilled the threat there of Malachi and he brought the curse upon the land. And that's what we're reading here in Mark chapters 11, 12, and 13. And it's even more stark and terrible in Matthew. Because this section in Matthew's gospel is expanded with a whole sermon in Matthew chapter 23, where seven times Jesus pronounces woe, woe, woe upon the people. Very solemn chapters. This is what the Apostle Paul is talking about in, two, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 16, where he talks about the people of Israel, that the wrath of God has come upon them to the full. Now, don't misunderstand me. This is not anti-Semiticism, as if they've got something against the Jews. If you read Luke chapter 19, verse 41 where we have the uh, triumphal entry into Jerusalem, which we read earlier from Mark 11. There's a little section just at the end of it. As Jesus has come into Jerusalem and looks around, what does he do? He doesn't gloat over them, say, ha, you're going to get it from the Romans. No, it's not gloating. 
He breaks down and sobs. He cries and he weeps over these people. And the Apostle Paul, who wrote to the Thessalonians about the wrath of God coming upon the Jews, he's not gloating. He tells us in Romans chapter 9 that he is so deeply upset that his people, the Jews, are rejecting Jesus Christ, that he would rather be thrown into hell if it would save these people. See, this isn't hostility or gloating over the judgment of God's people. No, there's the heart cry. This is tragic. And Paul warns the Gentiles in Romans 9, 10, and 11 to beware, lest we too are cut off. But although the Jews are the most privileged nation in the world, they are no longer the people of God. That description does not belong today to the natural descendants of Abraham, but it belongs today to the spiritual descendants of Abraham. So the promises in the Old Testament to the physical descendants of Abraham are grabbed hold of and claimed and come true for the spiritual descendants of Abraham. So in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 5 to 10, this is so clear. If you look at just verse 9, Peter is saying to the Gentiles in the church around Asia, Bithynia, Cappadocia, he says, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Those words which Moses told to the Hebrews coming out of Egypt, now the apostle Peter tells to the whole worldwide church. And for us in this uh, section here in 1 Peter 2 verse 5 which we'll look at later is very important where the temple we are living stones built into the temple the temple is made of people did you know that if you go and stand where I stood in Jerusalem and look at the temple it's made of blocks of stone but the temple of God today is made of you and me people if you, if you see detective films on the telly I, I do they always have this little advert before it for um, broadband talk talk and you have all these people linking together don't you and they make cars that go along or a world that's going around and the world is made of people and everything else well the temple of God is made of people the temple today is the people of God well let's get back to Mark chapters 11 to 13 as we have just mentioned, its section begins, Mark 11, 1 to 21, with the temple being condemned. And it ends, Mark chapter 13, 1 to 37, with the temple being destroyed. In Mark 13, verses 1 to 23, tell us of the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. And then the rest of the chapter explains that this is a picture of the day of judgment. We must take seriously the judgment of God. We have had ten chapters of Mark's gospel filled with the compassion of Christ. We have had 13 major miracles where, where Jesus Christ has taken the helpless and he has restored them. Where Jesus Christ shows his amazing love, his compassion... As we've gone through these 10 chapters of Mark's Gospel, there's hardly been a dark cloud anywhere. It's been wonderful as we've gone through. It's been so full of good news, it's been thrilling. And that's not surprising because the Gospel is good news and Jesus is the Saviour. You remember in the Old Testament that Isaiah prophesied that the, about the Messiah, the Spirit of the Lord is upon him to bring good news to the poor, to bring release to the captives, to open the eyes of the blind, to declare the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. But when Jesus Christ was in the uh, synagogue in Nazareth and he was given the scroll of Isaiah and he opened it and he read this bit and he was saying the spirit of the Lord is upon me to declare good news to the poor, to 
bring in the acceptable year of the Lord. And then he stopped. He didn't say, and the day of vengeance of our God. Not because the scriptures were wrong, but because that is deferred later. Jesus was bringing in the day of grace. Later, the day of judgment comes in. Do you see that? We've had so much about the grace of God, the good news that Jesus Christ brings to the world. But here in chapters 11, 12, and 13, we're told that there is the dark side. It's not good news for those who reject Jesus Christ. Jesus is the chosen stone. And either we build on him and become the temple, or we fall over him and fall to our destruction. Now, sadly, in our society, almost everybody seems to believe that if heaven exists, and they're going there, you know? And you can read books, five people you would like to meet in heaven or whatever, you know? Guaranteed you're going to be there and everybody else you want is going to be there as well. But that's not true. That is not true. There is a judgment to come. And many people in the Christian church believe that because they've trusted in Jesus Christ and they're not going to be judged. There's no judgment for them. They're all right. It doesn't matter how they be behave. They're okay. But they are wrong too. It is true that for the unsaved, that judgment is future. The day of judgment is still to come. But for us who are Christians, judgment begins already. Judgment begins with the household of God. Those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines today. And for those who are teachers, and preachers, and small group leaders, the judgment is even stricter. James says, don't let many of you be teachers because those who teach will be judged the more strictly. So don't think that because uh, we, we follow Jesus Christ and it doesn't matter how we behave, it matters very much how we live. Because for us as Christians, judgment begins already. We are saved from hell. But those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. Now, some people have a judgmental attitude and they love to preach this message. They can't. You give them in the pulpit and you give them a text, God is love, and they preach hell, fire, and judgment. <laughs> There are other people who have a sentimental attitude, you know, and they, they talk about the day of judgment and they just seem to think, tell you, well, the lake of fire has gone out. You know, there isn't a lake of fire anymore. And it's their personalities that come out. Well, it doesn't matter what our personalities are, whether we um, like or are terrified by these subjects, we have to preach them because they're in the word of of God. But as we preach on judgment, we must remember Luke 19, where Jesus had just ridden into Jerusalem and he wept over Jerusalem. And as we preach judgment, we preach it weeping over those who are going to judgment. Like the Apostle Paul when he preached judgment in Romans. And yet, such was his heartbeat that he prayed that he would be willing to be cast into hell if it meant that these people could be saved from hell. That's intercession. That's putting your heart for these people. You see, the truth is, if we are not saved, then we're still under judgment. And judgment is a terrible reality. And that was just the introduction. The central section here of these chapters 11 to 13 tell us that the temple teaching is mistaken. This is chapter 11, verse 27, all the way through to the end of chapter 12, where we have these five questions. I pointed out the questions too. Did you notice, though, that if you look at chapter 11 and verse 27... The first question is asked by the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders. That means the whole Sanhedrin. The second question, chapter 12, verse 13, was asked by the Pharisees 
and Herodians. The third question, chapter 12, verse 18, was asked by the Sadducees, and the fourth question, chapter 12, verse 28, was asked by some of the teachers of the law. And then the final question, chapter 12, verse 35, was asked by Jesus to them. And um, it's interesting, all these people, all these temple authorities, all these different groups representing the people of Israel, they come to Jesus and they throw their questions at Jesus. And Jesus answers them, exposing the emptiness of their beliefs. And these five questions form a chiasm. It's a bit like going up a mountain and down the other side. So you begin and end on the same plane. The first question and the fifth question deal with right belief. Who is Jesus? And both of them quote the Psalms. Chapter 12 and verse 11 quote Psalm 118 and chapter 12 and verse 36 quote Psalm 110. Do you know who Jesus is? The second and fourth questions deal with right living. So we have uh, our responsibility as people living in two kingdoms to uh, pay taxes to Caesar, to render to Caesar what is due to Caesar, and to render to God what is due to God, living in these two kingdoms. And the fourth question dealing with the greatest commandment tells us we're to love God and love our neighbor. You see the, the tension there, living in two kingdoms. And then the central question, the third question, deals with our right hope. Is there life after death? Who Jesus is, how we live as the people of God, heaven. And the problem there in verse 24 was that these People are in error because they do not know the scriptures or the power of God. That is their problem. They don't know the scriptures or the power of God. You see, logic is not enough. These religious leaders were basing their beliefs upon rational arguments. Jesus says you're in error because you don't know the scriptures or the power of God. And today, even in the Christian church, people will say, this is true because it's logical. You know, it's got to be right. We should almost add it to the end of our Bible because it's logical. Well, we do use logic to study the Bible, and hopefully we use a lot of logic when we preach. Lloyd-Jones spoke about preaching as logic on fire, didn't he? But our beliefs are not dictated to us by logic. Do you know why? Because our logic is fallen. Our minds are clouded by sin. Our logic is not infallible. You see, logic can raise stupid problems. Let me ask you, is God almighty? You say, yes, I say, well, logically. Is God able to create a stone so big and heavy that he can't lift it? Stupid question, isn't it? But, you know, logic will say, well, you know, if God is all-powerful, then he could do it. But then again, if God was all-powerful, then he could lift it. So he couldn't do it. And you just get yourself tied up in knots. Or if God is all-powerful, can he create a three-sided square? That's a nonsense question again. Uh, who did Cain marry? Ah, they've got all these questions. And you see, logic just tends to lead us down blind alleys sometimes. Indeed, if you study philosophy, you can end up logically not knowing whether you exist or not. I mean, how do we know that we exist? How do we know that we're not just the dream of some monster that's having a nightmare about a church service in Lansdowne Baptist Church, and we're just the product of his imagination? How do we know logically that we exist? And logic is limited. It's fallen leads us down blind alleys, and logic cannot fathom God. Who can explain the Trinity by the limits of human reason? Tell me, is Jesus Christ 100% God, or is he 100% man? Or is he 50% God, or 50% man? And I said, no, he's 100% God and 100% man. And you say, that's not logical. I say, I don't care. Jesus Christ is fully God, as if he's man, and he's fully man, 
as if he wasn't God. He is both fully God and fully man. 100% God and 100% man. How can logic explain divine sovereignty and human responsibility? It can't. So we love logic, but we realize that it is limited and it is fallen. And therefore we do not determine what we believe by whether we find it logical, but we determine what we believe by whether we find it biblical. All right? We are led by theology, not logic. So we stick with the scriptures. And where there are things that are above logic that we cannot fathom, then we humble ourselves before them. And we say, oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments, his paths beyond tracing out. We thank God for our minds and we will use our minds to the full. But we recognize that our minds are fallen and limited. And so we accept the scriptures as the authority that we believe and build our lives upon. Unfortunately, these people were testing Jesus because of logic. Logic isn't enough. The second problem was gut feelings. Gut feelings are not enough. Obviously. You see, these people, they looked at Jesus Christ and he wasn't doing what they felt the Messiah should be doing. So they rejected him. He wasn't pandering to their prejudices. And so they rejected him. They rejected him because they had this gut feeling that no, no, he can't be right, so just forget about him. And so Jesus leads us through these rationalistic arguments and these sinful prejudices. And he points us back to the scriptures and says you are in error because you do not understand the scriptures or the power of God. The word and the spirit. And this is where we are to stay under the word of God. We often say that as Christians we stand upon the word of God. Well that's in a sense true but in a sense it's not true. We don't stand on it, we stand under it. It is our authority. We are under the word of God. God says it, we believe it, and that's enough. And this is why we've got to preach systematically through the Bible. This is why I've got to teach it systematically, and why you've got to come week by week by week to learn it systematically. You see, I've been here six years, haven't I? And I haven't really preached on charismatic gifts. I haven't really preached on the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies. I haven't preached on the communion service and the Lord's Supper. I haven't preached on the end times and and maybe other subjects that are favorite subjects to you. And I haven't preached on them yet. Do you know what? Keep coming. (laughs) Because as time goes by, by God's grace, I will as we reach them in the scriptures. And um, if I deliberately avoid something that's in the text I preach on, then come and confront me about it. But our job is to be under the word of God, not to be over and reading into the word of God what we want to be there. When I was at college, we would have to do devotions each day. So a different student would come up and just share uh, the next passage of scripture with the rest of the students would give a 10 minute talk from it and it was quite helpful a challenge when you had to do it when you had to um, speak before 25 other budding uh, preachers but there was one guy there and you knew what he was going to say didn't matter what passage of scripture he had he had a bee in his bonnet about something and he always spoke on that subject and you knew it and you were never disappointed And he came to that college from Lansdowne Baptist Church. (laughs) You see, you mustn't have your theology like a potato chipper. You know what a potato chipper is. You get a potato, it doesn't matter what size or shape it is. You put it in and you push the handle down and out come the chips and they're all exactly the same shape. And you know, people have a theology like that. They come to the scriptures and they push their scriptures through their grid and out comes their teaching all exactly the same shape. Not affected by the scriptures, not affected by the text, just changed by that grid that potato chipper it goes through and we mustn't we mustn't mishandle the scriptures like that the scriptures are wonderful we must have the courage to believe them we must have the courage not to say i know what the bible says and it's got to agree with me but to have the courage to say that this is the word of god i'm going to believe what it says and it is going to change me i'm going to have the courage 
to build my life upon the word of God. And not to say I've got my gut reaction, I I think I know what's right and I'm going to force the Bible to uh, agree with me. But I'm going to take my fallen mind and I'm going to take my stubborn will and I'm going to take my wayward life and I'm going to bring it into obedience to the word of God. Submission to the word of God. Jesus confronted these people because they had made up their whole theology and they had gone off from the scriptures because of their rationalistic arguments and their gut feelings and they were rejecting Christ. And Jesus brings us back to this is your error. You do not know the scriptures or the power of God. Stick with the scriptures. And then the final section, chapter 13, verses 1 to 23 tell us that the temple is finished. As Jesus walked around the temple precincts there in Jerusalem, he could see the builders working hard. The scaffolding was up against the walls in the different buildings. For the last 40 odd years, builders had been expanding and renewing the temple that had been built by Zerubbabel. It was the second temple, or known as Herod's temple. And it wouldn't be completed till about AD 64 but it would be totally destroyed in A.D. 70. The Roman army was going to march into the temple and pull it all down. And from one point of view, that's totally tragic. The destruction of such a wonderful building. And yet from another perspective, it's, it's right. The temple is needed no more. It wasn't the real thing. It was a visual aid. And now we have the real thing. And so the temple of Jerusalem has to pass away. The temple was a very interesting place. Of course, the temple Jesus was in was the second temple. The first, the original, the greatest temple was Solomon's temple. And as a worshipper walked through the temple, when the worshipper knew that there weren't to be any images or any idols, as they walked through the temple, do you know what they saw on all the walls? tells us in 1 Kings chapter 6 verse 29 on the walls all around the temple in both inner and outer rooms he carved cherubim palm trees and open flowers why when there are to be no images no idols were these carved on all the walls because it's a picture of where the garden of eden isn't it do you see that cherubim trees flowers the garden of eden where god walked with mankind The temple is this picture of the Garden of Eden. It's here in the temple where God's presence was as people walked with God again. More than that, the temple was a replacement of the tabernacle. The tabernacle was the tent of meeting. This was in the center of the Israelite camp in the days of Moses when the people came out of uh, Egypt. And uh, the tabernacle, this tent, was made of bright colored materials picturing heaven. There was so much gold picturing heaven and none of the gold touched the earth. Even the gold poles had to go into silver sockets. They couldn't touch the earth showing that heaven is removed from earth. And the tabernacle or tent was rich in symbolism. Moses was commanded to make it. Exodus 25 verse 40 tells us, see that you make them, it's the tabernacle details according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. Moses was taken up Mount Sinai and was given a glimpse of the dwelling place of God and told to make the tabernacle as a representation on earth of God's dwelling in heaven. And so here we have God's dwelling in heaven. There we have the Garden of Eden where God dwelt with the people. Then we have the tabernacle. Then we have the first and second temples. This is what, these were the dwelling places of God. But then Jesus Christ was born. And you know what John tells us at the beginning of his gospel? John chapter 1 and verse 14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling amongst us. Or literally, he tabernacled amongst us. Jesus is the tabernacle. He is the presence of God on earth. And in the next chapter, chapter 2 of John's gospel, uh, verses 19 to 21, Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. The Jews 
uh, replied that it's taken 46 years to build this temple, and are you going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. Did you see that? The temple there in Jerusalem was a picture, a visual aid of Jesus. He is where God touches the earth. He is God with us. In him the whole fullness of the deity lived in bodily form. The temple and the tabernacle were pictures of Jesus' body. But now, Jesus' body is in heaven glorified. And we, the Christian church, are the body of Christ on earth. So Paul tells the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 19 to 22. Ephesians 2, 19 to 22. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people, and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him... The whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. You see that? We now are becoming the living stones in the temple. So Peter tells his readers in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Now this is serious business. The church is not an organization. It's not just some kind of business. It's not even a rescue mission. For sinners, it's the temple in which God lives by his spirit. And we are living stones making up the temple. And some of the living stones have rough edges, which make it pretty difficult for other people. And some of us are living stones which are tending to crumble because of difficulties or problems and need supporting. But we're all being built together. We become the house of God. The temple on earth. And so Paul reminds the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. He says, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple? All of you are God's temple. And that God's spirit lives in you as a church. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is sacred. And you are that temple. The Jewish temple is history. Look around you. See the living stones that make up God's temple here in Lansdowne. It's sacred. We can destroy it by bizarre teachings, by pride and anger, by bitterness and criticism. It's deadly serious. Recognize God's temple. Realize it's sacred, but it's not perfect. No, we have to wait till heaven for that. And so in Revelation chapter 21, John sees the perfect temple and its glory. And he tells us in Revelation 21 verses 2 and 3, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a voice from the throne saying, Now! The dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. And we're going to be in the presence of God forever. We don't go back to the tabernacle or the temple or, or even the Garden of Eden. We are in God's presence in glory forever. And we are the dwelling place of God. And he lives with us and in us forever. Do you remember I told you when I was 18, I saw the walls of the temple and I tingled all over. I should get that every time I stand in this pulpit. Because I should look around and I should see the living stones that make up the temple of God today. It should make me tingle, not just because I see it, but because I'm privileged to be a part of it. I'm privileged to be one of the living stones in this temple that God is building, in which God lives by his spirit. And you're in it too. And tomorrow, when you go to work, remember that you are a part of that temple in which God lives by his spirit. Where God 
have fellowship with people on earth. You are living stones. And as you go to the shops, remember that you're one of those living stones. I think David Livingstone had a good name, didn't he? But you can have the same name as well. You're a living stone. And remember that his temple is glorious. His temple is sacred. So let's be careful how we live. Be careful how we treat one another. And let's be privileged to be living stones in his temple. Let's pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we know that the day of judgment is coming. We're privileged to be in the day of grace. And we're privileged to be objects of your mercy. And we pray that as your temple was to be a light to the Gentiles and a place of prayer for the nations, we ask that we might be a light to the world and that we might pray those prayers that move mountains. And we ask that you would fill us with your spirit and that we might be fitly joined together that you might build us up for your glory and honor. Amen. Well, let's sing. Looking forward to the future, there's a sound on the wind like a victory song. Listen now, let it rest on your soul. Looking forward to that new heavens and new earth.
that we have that is in Jesus Christ, that he is coming again. And we thank you for the blessing that comes to us from Jesus Christ because he came the first time and died in our place and rose again. And we thank you for the blessing we have through feeding upon your word. We thank you for our children, those in Sunday school, Jucos, uh, Coveys, Focus. We pray your blessing upon them and us, and as we go, may we keep in your spirit, may we walk in the light, and may we be fitly joined together for your glory and honor.